Hello and please welcome to today's last session on NRSEM 2021. In this session we are hosting Professor Thomas Bowing from Rhode Island, USA, Assistant Professor Berto Akuntu from the Middle East Technical University, North Cyprus, uh, Dr. Aslıhan Güzin Selçuk from Istanbul Gelişim University, Turkey, and Professor Nazihan Ursavaş from Recep Tayyip Erdogan University, Turkey. Firstly, I would like to invite Professor Boving to deliver the first presentation of this session. Um, thank you, everybody. I hope you can see my screen, my PowerPoint. Yeah. Um, Can everybody see my screen, please? Not yet, Professor. Yes. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. So um, first, uh, thank you very much to the committee that organized the conference for inviting me. I'm very honored to give my presentation to you and everybody who is listening. Um, my talk is about advances in groundwater remediation technology, and I'm trying to give a perspective about how the remediation industry for groundwater cleanup has uh, evolved over the last 40, 50 years. Uh, do you see my next screen? So the, uh, uh, let me briefly introduce myself. I'm a professor of environmental hydrology at the University of Rhode Island. I'm uh, cross-affiliated with the Department of Civil Environmental Engineering as well as the Department of Geosciences. My PhD is in hydrology from the University of Arizona in Tucson. And before that, I was working as an environmental hydrologist in Germany, where I'm originally from, and I was responsible for site investigation and remediation. So I'm uh, talking a little bit about my personal experience uh, being in the business for quite some time and also uh, teaching at the university level. So the history of uh, remediation is mostly from the perspective of the USA and Western Europe. And then I will also talk about a more global perspective later on when I talk about current and future trends. So the origin of the remediation industry, cleaning up soil and polluted groundwater started in the late 1970s. And at the time it was a very small, niche market, very small companies, nothing specialized, but it quickly turned into what it is today, a multi-billion dollar industry. And that was in response to environmental disasters. Some of them are mentioned here, Union Carbide in Bhopal in 1984, Seveso, Italy, where large amounts of dioxine were spilled, or the many, many uh, spills that polluted the River Rhine in the 80s and so on and so on. But these environmental disasters continue today. I mean, here are just a few uh, examples, uh, dumping of waste in Indian rivers, um, Indonesia, the Citroen River, uh, China, the United States. It's a, it's a global problem and it remains Professor a problem Boeing, for, yeah? I sincerely apologize for interrupting, Professor. Yes. Um, we do not see your uh, slides if you are skipping them. Oh no. Which slide are you seeing? We're still at the first slide. Oh my god. Um, can you see this slide now? Yes, yes, we can see now. I am so sorry, I didn't know, I didn't know. Sorry um, for interrupting, Professor. No, thank you, you thank continue. you for letting me know. So let me go to, can you see the slide saying infamous environmental disasters? Yes, Professor, we can see. Okay. All right, so let me uh, remake my point that uh, it was in the late 1970s or early 1980s when uh, many remediation companies began to respond to disasters like Seveso, um, 
or uh, the polluted river Rhine in Germany, Switzerland, Opal, India. These are just a few examples. But today there are many more examples. So the situation has improved. The environment is certainly cleaner in some parts of the world, but in other parts of the world, the situation is probably as bad as it was in Europe and in the United States, like in the 1980s. So this basically sparked the emergence of the remediation industry. Whereas in the early days, it was mostly engineering construction firms that uh, went into the remediation market by excavating contaminated soils or uh, treating polluted groundwater. These firms were, firms were basically small and they were, it was basically a niche market where uh, large companies hadn't realized the growth potential of the remediation industry. So in the 1980s, the focus was primarily on petroleum contamination, meaning uh, gasoline compounds, diesel fuels, l apples, light non-aqueous phase liquids. And at these early, in these early days, the dominant remediation technologies were excavation and pump and treat. Pump and treat, I will show you a slide in a minute. Most everybody is aware of it. And that was the go-to technologies. And then slowly other technologies evolved, such as soil vapor extraction, air sparging, and the initial beginnings of what was later the, the aerobic bioremediation uh, technology. So in pump and treat, which is a very simple system, one puts a pump into the contaminated groundwater and starts pumping and pr uh, uh, produces the uh, water to the surface where it's then treated either by activated carbon or maybe by air stripping technology. A very simple technology, but also not very effective. Pump and treat is uh, very widely used and still is widely used today, but it's simply not effective. In the early days, it was mostly applied to leaking underground storage tanks. Uh, gas stations were investigated by the hundreds. Back when I was early in my career, we were on gas stations every week testing for benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene. And those were by the hundreds. And uh, we learned a lot from investigating these underground storage tanks and the Naples spills that come with it. But it was also a time when we didn't know what really to do with, let's say, residuals in soil. Allen apple because the technologies at our disposal were limited in their effectiveness, such as pump and treat and um, soil vapor extraction. And if I may just share some of anecdotal evidence from my work in Germany, um, we, we tested so many gas stations that I would uh, say that about 40% of these older gas stations, and by older I mean the gas stations with steel tanks are likely contaminated. And of these 40%, I would say at least 10% were massively contaminated where it was absolutely common to find l apple floating gasoline, like shown in this picture, on top of the aquifer and um, the soil heavily contaminated with, with drippings of uh, gasoline. So skipping forward 10 years, by the mid-1990s, the focus shifted a little bit away from um, gasoline compounds towards chlorinated solvents, compounds like TCE, PCE. And instead of l apple, we're now talking d apple, dense non-aqueous phase liquids. Also, dissolved metals became an issue, and uh, not just groundwater, but also the soil itself, sediment contamination, uh, material in lakes and rivers, and so on and so on. Up to this point, pump and treat still remained the dominant treatment technology, even so uh, people agreed that it was not a very effective technology. New technologies that slowly emerged at the time were engineering reductive dechlorination or permeable reactive barriers. Uh, another technology is anaerobic bioremediation and thermal technologies. Of these technologies, I just want to briefly talk about the first one, uh, permeable reactive barriers. 
which is still used today. It is a very simple technology, a passive treatment where groundwater, polluted groundwater, enters a wall in the surface, which is permeable to the water, but not permeable to the uh, contaminants. The contaminants such as PCE, TCE, will be degraded uh, via a reaction that involves elemental iron. And during the treatment process, these compounds are successively dechlorinated, resulting in benign uh, compounds such as ethene, ethane, and ultimately carbon dioxide and water. And again, this technology is still very much uh, in use today with slight modifications, but uh, very effective. Another technology that began to emerge at this time was bioremediation. Here, bioremediation is uh, taking advantage of the naturally occurring bacteria that uh, feast on contaminants, including uh, petroleum hydrocarbons and to some degree chlorinated solvents. These compounds are biodegraded if the conditions are right, and the bioremediation technology is basically ensuring that the uh, conditions are right for these contaminants to do the optimum to degrade pollution in the subsurface, soil as well as groundwater. Moving forward, in the 2000s, emerging contaminants entered the discussion. And here in the US, it was sparked, the uh, discussion about emerging contaminants was sparked by MTBE, shown here which at the time was a additive to gasoline to replace the lead that was a part of the gasoline formulation until the 2000s. It turned out that MTBE was uh, at least as bad in terms of groundwater pollution than uh, the previous lead was. And people started talking about, oh, we have issues with contaminants that we don't know about. And how that was how emerging contaminants entered the discussion. In terms of remediation technologies, um, there was great progress made, a much better understanding of remediation hydraulics, the influence of hydrology, and consequently a new branch of engineering emerged, and that's referred to as engineering or remediation engineering. Um, at the same time, in terms of uh, technologies, in situ chemical oxidation, or short ISCO, evolved. And in ISCO, the uh, goal is to inject a oxidant such as permanganate, which is depicted in the small picture here, which oxidizes contaminants and turns them into uh, benign compounds such as CO2 as CO2 and water. Moving forward in uh, 2010s, the remediation technologies that have been developed over the past decades are now maturing um, PRBs I mentioned, permeable barrier, bioremediation, in situ oxidation, are all technologies that found widespread application in the 2010s. At the same time, regulatory standards are emerging, and not just for conventional uh, legacy compounds, but also for emerging contaminants, such as MTBE and others. The remediation of large plumes became a discipline on its own. It was not until the 2010s that large plumes were often considered impossible to remediate. And people typically shied away from even attempting, but with a better understanding of hydrology, hydraulics, and uh, remediation engineering in general, uh, these plumes became a discipline of its own, the remediation of these plumes. And also <clears throat> in terms of market, the uh, many companies that started out in the 80s, 90s, began to merge and were bought up or acquired by larger companies. At least in uh, the US and Europe, we now have uh, large companies that are specifically focused on the remediation and doing so worldwide. In the following table, I'm summarizing some of the most common and innovative remediation technologies, starting with pump and treat, which I said earlier is not very effective, but still very much in use. Um, other technologies include soil vapor extraction, air sparging, bioremediation, permanent reactive barrier, chemically enhanced flushing, and so on and so on. And on the right-hand side, you see uh, 
how much these technologies are being accepted in the market. Many of them are, can be considered established. Some of them are still somewhat innovative. So I found this interesting article uh, by Condit and Ali from 2017. The authors mined data from remediation uh, of groundwater, surface water, soils, in, and found from over 4,000 4, abstracts that were submitted between 2006 and 16 that these keywords such as PFAS, DMAPL, LNAPL recovery, and so on and so on came up at the top. So this, these are the current research topics where people are dealing with in the real world. And this includes everything from arsenic to iron to 1,4-dioxin and so on and so on. The main issue I'm going to focus next is on emerging contaminants and PFAS. In this graph, I, uh, or Loss and Ali, I should say, summarize the detections of emerging contaminants in European groundwater. And as you can see, there are many compounds that you readily familiar with, such as DEET, which is an insecticide, caffeine, P4, PFOS, right? And then there are many others that are maybe not quite so common and are mostly uh, pharmaceuticals and personal care products. But the bottom line is um, these findings by Lars paint a pretty clear picture that in most every water in Europe, and I would say probably around the world, one, fill, one will find uh, emerging contaminants. So these emerging contaminants are a challenge because the large area of contaminants that are being involved, the chemical uh, structure is different, their environmental behavior is significantly different. So it is quite difficult to find a silver bullet. I would say there is no such thing as a silver bullet to address all these compounds. So what the remediation industry faces is the need for finding the right technology for the right compound. And um, in this context, I would like to talk about remediation of PFAS, PFAS short for poor, poor and polyfluoroalkyl substances. And this is a big issue right now in the United States. And I understand it's also becoming a big issue in Europe as well and in many other countries. The remediation of PFAS is extremely difficult because we are dealing with compounds that are extremely recalcitrant, extremely stable, originally designed to resist high temperature. That's why these compounds have been used in uh, products such as firefighting agents or Teflon, so for cooking purposes. And they have been used since the 1940s in different extents and different variations. But since the 1940s, PFAS have been around. And once in the environment or in the human body, for that matter, it's very difficult to get rid of them. And only the strongest oxidation um, reduction technologies uh, based on chemical radicals and some other technologies can actually break these very um, strong fluorine-fluorine bonds. So remediation of PFAS is the current challenge and again will probably be with us for the foreseeable future. And the other thing I would like to notice is that uh, besides emerging contaminants, we're now uh, looking at a global or inter international market where um, the remediation is being um, being marketed not just in the US or in Western Europe, but also in uh, Africa, in Africa, Asia, and basically around the world. So we're talking a global competition for uh, new jobs, for new contracts, and to some estimates, the market in China alone is about $15 billion. And this graph basically repeats what I just said, that uh, the uh, environmental rem remediation market remains very active and the future growth potential is primarily in the Asia-Pacific region, so way ahead of uh, North America and Europe. But the problem is that in many markets, um, even so there's demand, there's also a lot of hindrance, 
restricting factors, meaning technologies that exist are finding only slow implementation because there's a lack of aware awareness about these technologies. Also, there is in some countries a, a slow response to environmental uh, issues, meaning, yes, there are laws in place, but these laws are not enforced enough. And then on top of that, and this is where academia comes in, there's a lack of training, meaning there are few or too few engineers and professionals, hydrologists, that can actually work with these technologies effectively and to their full potential. So there's a great need for training and for uh, uh, developing the future workforce. So with this, I like to conclude my talk. Um, the point I made or the points I made is that demand for remediation professionals remains strong and actually is a growth market in some areas. Um, these future professionals have the hands full dealing with emerging contaminants and all the legacy compounds, which are still very much around and haven't been addressed adequately in many places, including leaking underground storage tanks and petroleum hydrocarbons and so on. And the remediation industry will particularly see great growth in areas, uh, including Asia Pacific and uh, potentially Africa in the not so long uh, future. So with that, I like to briefly mention my references. Um, too small to read, of course, but if you're interested in uh, getting information about some of the references listed here, please let me know. And with that, I like to thank you and hand it back to the organizer committee. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your valuable presentation, Professor Boving. Now I would like to continue with the second speaker, Assistant Professor Dr. Berto Akuntu from the Middle East Technical University, North Cyprus. Uh, hello. Hello, Professor. I think it's okay. It's, a, it's, it's okay, okay, Professor. It's okay, Professor. You, you can continue. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, this kind invitation as a keynote speaker. Uh, my presentation will be about the floods and sustainable urban design. Uh, I'm a faculty member uh, from a civil engineering program, Middle East Technical University, Northern Cyprus campus. I will all, I'm also presenting this here uh, on behalf of uh, Chamber of Civil Engineers uh, as a member of Water Management Committee. <clears throat> I will give you uh, briefly a talk about the global warming climate change and some uh, design stormwater uh, drainage systems, and the urban flooding is a uh, significant problem nowadays and uh, how we can deal with the urban flooding. I will talk about the water sensitive urban design. Uh, as you know quickly, if I uh, remind you that as you know, uh, the sunlight passes through the atmosphere and warms the earth, uh, but infrared radiation is given off by the earth. But because of the uh, carbon dioxide emission, the atmosphere thickness is getting uh, thicker and thicker. And because of that, uh, more heat is trapped uh, inside of the, uh, between atmosphere and the earth, and the earth uh, temperature is increasing. If you look at the uh, percentage of uh, gases in atmosphere, we see that the carbon dioxide uh, uh, contributes significant with a uh, more than 50 percent and this uh, methane gas comes uh, second if you look at the carbon dioxide uh, concentration uh, changes by time 
we see that uh, since 1960, this is the recorded uh, data, since 1960, there is a significant increase in carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. And as today, we see that it is uh, 14,014 uh, and uh, still it is increasing. <clears throat> when we look at the data uh, from the Gotthard Institute of NASA, the, we see that the average temperature of the world increase uh, by a little more than one degree centigrade since 1880. And when we look at the uh, evidence uh, for the uh, how this temperature and carbon dioxide concentration change uh, in the atmosphere, uh, we can look at 800 years, uh, 800,000 years old uh, ice in Antarctica, uh, which is actually the samples of the ices are taken around three kilometers uh, down from the ice. And the bubbles in the ice core uh, preserves actual samples of the world's Asian atmosphere. And using uh, that bubbles, using that old ices, uh, like a history book, uh, we can get an idea about what was the carbon dioxide or methane or temperature during that ancient times uh, in the atmosphere. So when we look at this data, we see that actually uh, there is a very high correlation between the average temperature in atmosphere uh, in, in the surface of the earth and carbon dioxide con concentration in the atmosphere. And if we look at uh, current uh, amount of carbon dioxide concentration, we see that we have never seen uh, about 300 uh, parts per million, and currently we are 414 uh, ppm. This also this also shows uh, the evidence of uh, carbon dioxide concentration uh, in the atmosphere. So who is contributing mainly? Uh, in the world, and we see that uh, US and China is dominating actually uh, the greenhouse gas emission as uh, two uh, countries. <clears throat> uh, of course, uh, we said that temperature is average temperature is already increased uh, 1%. In other words, this, uh, this doesn't mean that uh, the temperature change only one degree. Uh, one decrease is not uh, making big changes because this is the average uh, value. And if we assume that the uh, center of this distribution is at the uh, is changing one degree, when the mean uh, is uh, moving one degree, this means that uh, the extreme hot weather probability of having extreme hot days. Uh, will be higher relative to uh, before this one degrees increase. Of course, this is uh, this increase in uh, this changes uh, this increase in temperature causes uh, the change in climate conditions, and we can really uh, recognize and see that or every uh, experience that there is an increase in frequency of uh, extreme rainfall intensities, which means we are having. Uh, more frequent flood events, and also another in another end, more frequent drought events or more prolonged uh, extended drought events. When we look at the uh, number of the uh, flood events per decade, how they are changed uh, in last uh, six decades from 1950 to 2000, then we see a significant increase by uh, decades. In, and these changes are happening uh, in every uh, continent. Uh, and recently, uh, we, if you look at the 2000-2010 uh, uh, decade, uh, it is really a significant uh, increase relative to previous decades. And therefore, uh, we are experiencing very, very significant drought events, which is, this is a picture from uh, 2009 flood in Istanbul and another uh, floods even in Cyprus, which is known as a dry country. But uh, starting from 2010, we have also started to experience lots of flood, uh, number of flood situations in Cyprus as well. 
Of course, floods are around the world. Uh, this is a picture from Alberta, Canada in 2013. Another flood uh, from Cyprus in 2014. Uh, and the same uh, year uh, at another location, which is a touristic uh, city in Cyprus, Kyrenia. And this is a picture of uh, one of the important uh, streets. So when we look on the other hand, okay, from one side, uh, climate is changing and we are having more extreme uh, flood situations. But on the other hand, if you look at the population, there is also a significant increase in population. When we look at the uh, population uh, variation uh, in since from 1820, we see that actually in first uh, from 1820 to 1890, approximately 60 million per population was increased population of the world increased by 6 million per year but if you look at 1890 to 1950 this is almost doubled and uh, the ratio of increase in population is around 15 million per year however when we look at the 1950 to 2019 or 2020 current condition there is a significant uh, increase in uh, in the population of the world. Every year, approximately 70 million, uh, the, the population is increasing by 70 million uh, per year. So this, of course, puts an additional stress on the earth, uh, mainly for the urbanization. And when we look at the urbanization, we see a significant increase in urbanization in the last uh, couple of decades. So if you look at this case, on the one side, there is a global increase in global temperature. These are uh, increases the flood frequency. On the other side, there is an increase in global population and this causes an increase in urbanization. So when those two come together, from one side, very extreme uh, flood uh, conditions or very extreme rainfall events. On the other side, a very, uh, very high rate of urbanization. So, uh, and if the urbanization uh, is not very well planned, mainly for the uh, urban areas that are uh, having some river uh, crossings, uh, mainly having a significant problem life loss and economic loss. Uh, so the reason uh, to what kind of solution uh, we can do. So as you see in this picture, uh, sustainable urban developments should be uh, considered because such as we are seeing that there are lots of uh, urban areas that the rivers are crossing these urban areas. And this is one case. One flooding situation is maybe the rain events are not happening exactly uh, on top of the urban area, but the, it is happening, the extreme rain events are happening in the mountains, but uh, while water is flowing down through the mountains, uh, the urban areas being underwater. This is the case for river crossing the urban area. On the other hand, second case is uh, the cities itself are taking significant amount of high rainfall intensities. In this case, the existing stormwater networks are not uh, capable of uh, draining uh, that water. And we, we see uh, this kind of uh, picture around the world. So in order to decrease the risk of urban flooding, uh, we have to do more sustainable uh, flood management. I can give you a couple of examples from the world. For example, this is a picture from a town, Morris, uh, from Manitoba, Canada. And in 1950s or before 1950s, that, uh, that town was being underwater uh, frequently. Uh, but later on, uh, they applied some sustainable flood management and they covered the town with, an, uh, with a dike uh, and they protected protect the town uh, for future flooding conditions. This is a picture from 1997 flood. And you see that the same town uh, is protected by dikes and it's not uh, flooded anymore. In 1950s, it was like that. But now 
as you see, outside of the town is completely flooded. This is a very flat area. It is completely flooded, but the city or town is completely dry. And it, usually they are uh, dealing with their main streets. This is the main street of the town Morris in 1950. And, and this is now uh, how the main street is showing when under the flood conditions. And in this similar, in the same river, another city, uh, which is called Winnipeg, uh, that city was also having significant amount of flood problems in 1950s and earlier. And then they decided to uh, take care of the solution, find the solution for this flooding situations. And they applied a floodway. Uh, this is a channel. A uh, man-made channel uh, from the beginning of the uh, city to the end of the uh, city, and they call it floodway, Winnipeg floodway. And actually, the length of the floodway is around 47 kilometer long, which is quite long, and 350 meter wide. It's one of the most uh, important uh, project of uh, Canadian story. Uh, recently, if we look at the very, very recent uh, flood situations, uh, last July, actually, it was one of the worst months on records. According to flood list, uh, 124 flood events and more than, at more than 385 locations are happened. And more, around 1,000 people killed in these floods uh, during the July 2021. And when we look at the uh, countries that are affected from this uh, flood, we see uh, the developed countries as well, such as Belgium and Germany. And I think in Germany, around 160 people died because of the floods. And these are some pictures from, the, from Germany. And uh, we see that there, is, there was a small uh, river crossing the villages. Uh, it's been... According to the uh, people living there, they mentioned that in last hundred years, they have never seen such kind of uh, flow amount and all their houses and uh, their infrastructures, everything was underwater. It was a big uh, disaster uh, and 160 people died uh, in Germany because of this flood situations. Of course, the main reason you can see the landslides here because of the uh, excess amount of uh, in rainfall. And main reason of this one is excess amount of uh, in high intensity of rainfall. Uh, as you see in this picture on the left-hand side, uh, the, green, uh, the, red the red point shows around 170, 180 millimeter of rainfall ob obtained uh, during one storm event. So that's why a very extreme uh, flood situation experience, uh, unfortunately, at that location. If I give you a similar kind of study from Cyprus that we uh, conducted before, uh, we have the capital city, Nicosia. This is a city in uh, Nicosia, in, in Cyprus, capital city. And this capital city, and uh, there are two uh, creeks uh, bringing water to capital city. And in the city, those two creeks are coming together and flowing. So we have experience in 2010, we have ex experienced a significant flood event uh, in that city. And after a couple of years, I think it was in 2014, another flood happened. So in this study, we check what, uh, what is the purpose of, what is the reason of this flood and what kind of remedial measures uh, can be taken. Uh, of course, we look at the, we apply the frequency analysis, uh, digital elevation modeling, size of hydraulic structure. I'm sorry, uh, I'm giving this presentation from home. Uh, digital elevation modeling, uh, size of hydraulic structure, general generation of dam for the floodplains, hydrologic modeling we applied, rainfall runoff modeling, basin identification and properties. 
uh, later on we apply the hydraulic modeling, uh, river flow modeling in the river channels and flood plains and development of flood maps uh, obtained at the end. So if I give you a brief uh, information, uh, first of all, we consider 2010 flood as a reference uh, flood. Uh, and this is on the left hand side, this heatograph shows the rainfall intensity uh, which is exceeding the 20 millimeter per hour. And this exceeding uh, this period uh, generates very high flow in two basins that I showed you in the previous slides. And uh, the peak flow that is the maximum uh, discharge that we are getting was 80 meter cube per second in Kanlikoy Basin and 70 meter cube per second in uh, Gönyeli Basin. So uh, we took number of cross sections along the river and we develop uh, hydraulic modeling approximately a 50 kilometer uh, long uh, channels. We took number of 269 cross sections and there were 24 hydraulic structures and we all put them into a, a flood modeling uh, tool which is called Mike. Uh, then we also develop uh, surface uh, characteristics, including the topographic characteristics and roads, uh, buildings, uh, all these elevations, which is called digital elevation model. Using this digital elevation model, we uh, put the uh, flow into the uh, modeling, we develop flow, and we try to match uh, the modeling uh, flood map with the existing 2010 flood map. In this picture, when you see the red points, red lines, red lines shows the boundaries of uh, 2010 flood extent. And the blue ones are called uh, uncalibrated model. Uh, and the uh, yellow one shows the calibration because we applied some calibration uh, applications in order to get the 2010 flood before we use this model for other different uh, simulations. And after that, we check the Kanlikoy pond uh, for 500 year rainfall uh, data. And we recognize that when we look at the topographic uh, maps, we recognize that the upstream side of the uh, of Kanlikoy pond, there is, very there is a very uh, good location that additional dam could be uh, constructed. And we, in the model, we assume that if, what if we design this uh, dam and how much this new upstream dam will protect uh, the city of Nicosia from flooding. And in this case, we have seen that if we generate, if we uh, design this uh, dam up at the upstream location and the, uh, the peak flow value uh, drops down significantly and it, uh, protects the city uh, very well. On the other hand, there is another uh, uh, basin, which is Gönyeli Pond Basin. Uh, however, when we check the topographic conditions, it's not possible to design uh, an additional uh, reservoir or dam uh, at the upstream side of this pond. In this case, we tried different uh, scenarios, such as uh, excavating the bottom of the pond and incre or increasing the height of the dam. And in this case, of course, because of urbanization around the uh, pond, uh, unfortunately, we cannot increase it uh, enough. Uh, so we tried uh, different scenarios, but it's not possible to decrease the uh, peak flow uh, to the level that will not cause a flood situation. So at the end, we decide we have end up with the with a solution that it is possible to build a dam uh, at the upstream side of Kanlukoy Dam, and it is possible to dredge uh, Gönyeli Pond and rise it a little bit at least. But uh, additionally, uh, some part of uh, Akusdere Creek, which is starting from the Gönyeli Pond and goes to the center of the Ni center of Nicosia. Uh, this part of these, uh, this river should be uh, covered with concrete. In this case, the water flow, water height elevation, water elevations can be uh, dropped to uh, in the channel level. 
Another important problem is a sustainable stormwater drainage system, because this is one thing that I mentioned, uh, which is about the, uh, if, the, if a river is crossing a city, maybe in this case, the river uh, city itself is not taking significant amount of rainfall, but the uh, mountains are taking significant amount of rainfall and this flow reaches to the uh, city. Uh, what we experienced in 2010 and 2014 uh, floods in Nicosia was exactly like this. But additionally, another problem is uh, the city itself is taking very extreme uh, intensity of rainfall. In this case, for example, if I try to explain it briefly, there is an equation to calculate the peak discharge for small catchments. These are the, as you see from this equation, peak discharge is actually equal to runoff coefficient, rainfall intensity, and catchment area. Uh, what is uh, runoff coefficient? Depending on different land use, we are defining the runoff coefficient. This runoff coefficient, such as if it is an industrial area, it is, if it is an asphalt region, this runoff coefficient is around 0 0.9. In other words, this means that 90% of the rainfall will, will run at the surface, uh, such as flood apartment areas. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the grass cover, uh, if, it, if it is a uh, not a very urban area, we see that this coefficient is going down to 40% or 50%. This means that 40% uh, of the rainfall will run at the surface. Uh, but road and highways are very high. Almost all rainfall runs at the surface. So mainly our city centers are covered with this kind of uh, materials. So uh, another factor that we are calculating in the peak discharge is intensity, rainfall intensity. So we are calculating the time of concentration and so according to selected return period, we are reading the intensity from the IDF curve of the uh, city. Uh, so, but intensities are also increasing uh, recently. Uh, so uh, we have to deal with this intensity. The last parameter is area. Uh, we cannot change area. Uh, but maybe we can change any other parameter on this equation. So climate is changing, rainfall intensity is increasing, and in this case, design discharges are increasing. Since I value in this equation is increasing, design discharge is increasing because the area is the same area, surface characteristics such as asphalt, roofs uh, are the same thing. So since intensities are increasing, peak discharges are increasing, but our uh, stormwater networks are not designed according to those peak discharges. So we are having urban flooding. In this case, intensity is increasing, discharge is increasing. So what we should do? We see this kind of urban flooding uh, in, the, in the urban areas. Uh, this is exactly uh, the case that um, ex uh, existing stormwater network is not capable of draining this water because High, uh, the, uh, it is the high intensity of rainfall is bringing uh, larger than design discharge, which is uh, designed, maybe these uh, cities are designed uh, maybe 40, 50 years ago. So uh, intensity are increasing, discharges are increasing. So there are different uh, approaches to solve this problem. One of them is maybe we have to change the size of the pipes under the ground. So we have to excavate each and every street and put larger size of pipes or put additional pipes in the in every street. Of course, this is not an easy situation in a city. Uh, alternatively, when we look at this equation, alternatively, in order to decrease the peak discharge, we can decrease the runoff coefficient. Okay, is it possible to de uh, decrease the runoff coefficient? In this case, uh, stress on our storm networks uh, may be decreased by decreasing runoff coefficient. What we can apply, we can apply green roof, we can apply rainwater harvesting, uh, we can change the surface characteristics, more permeable surfaces we can select, 
and we can increase the infiltration uh, capacity in the cities, in the urban areas. These four applications in general called sustainable stormwater management. It is also called water sensitive uh, urban design. In the Middle East, Germany, Australia, it, the, this idea is mainly called water sensitive urban design. In USA, it is called low impact development. And in UK, mainly it's known as sustainable drainage systems. So what is fundamental concept? Decentralized uh, water sensitive management. We have to divide it into small parts, small areas, and we have to deal with uh, small areas. Of, of course, aesthetic view is important, functionality is important and should be usable. Of course, the public awareness and acceptability is a very important case. So as you see in this figure, in the normal cities on the left-hand side, uh, evaporation is low and surface infiltration is very low. Therefore, the runoff is very high. Uh, what is uh, tried to be changed in the cities, mainly high infiltration. So surfaces, impermeable surfaces must be replaced with permeable surfaces in order to increase the infiltration some storage, uh, water storage uh, places or reservoirs should be designed in the cities uh, and the runoff coefficient should, runoff amount should be decreased. If we can manage uh, this one, uh, in this case, we will have more close uh, natural uh, circulation of the runoff. <clears throat> So rainwater harvesting and infiltration wells, these are the uh, some pictures that I can show you. Uh, for example, the roofs can be collected. Uh, water, water raining to the roof can be collected. Infiltration wells could be installed. Of course, this depends on the soil characteristics uh, of that place, if there, if there is a possibility of infiltration. Uh, for example, in the uh, parking lots, uh, some uh, pervious uh, asphalt payments can be used and at the bottom of the parking lots can be used as a uh, storage, water storage. So this delays the uh, rain uh, runoff to go to the network. In this case, the network capacity could be uh, enough for extreme uh, intensity cases. This is a construction of a parking lot. As you see, uh, that will be the uh, infiltration basin. So water will be stored under the parking lot and then will be used later on uh, for irrigation of the green areas, for example. And again, the surfaces are permeable parking places instead of just asphalt parking places, more permeable uh, materials are selected such as this is another example from uh, England. And additionally, some uh, detention uh, basins or infiltration uh, reservoirs could be constructed in order to store water uh, before giving, the, uh, giving them into the stormwater network. Uh, at the capital, uh, at the center of the cities, mainly majority of the surfaces are covered by impermeable materials. Uh, but uh, additional solution, uh, th there could be solution for those as well. As you see this picture here, there are some uh, basketball uh, or football playgrounds, some uh, places, but these are low elevations. These are, as you see, lower than the normal ground level. So when an extreme storm events are happening, these places can work like a storage and can delay the uh, runoff to go to the stormwater network of the city. So under the, uh, for example, this is an example from Rotterdam. Uh, when it is raining a lot, all these places are working like a small reservoir to collect the rainwater. And football, ground, football fields or some other places are also can be designed according to this idea which we call it water sensitive urban design. For example, a park, uh, a ch children playground could work like this, typical condition, but three times in a year, it is estimated that three times in a year, uh, it, it will be some uh, flooding in this region. So people, kids still can enjoy, 
but once in a year it will be completely flooded. But this flooding of this uh, playground will help uh, to uh, will help the stress on the stormwater network. <clears throat> As you see, this is also a playground, a basketball uh, field playground, but it is lower than the normal elevation. So it works like a storage uh, reservoir. Another uh, case study I can uh, share with the, uh, in this context is we have tried uh, an application of water sensitive urban design for Güzelyurt. Uh, we look at the Güzelyurt stormwater network design. As you see in this slide, uh, there are different colors uh, of line. These lines shows the stormwater pipelines uh, under the ground. Uh, it's not uh, installed in under every street in Güzelyurt. Mainly the, in the main streets, there are uh, stormwater network. And as you see at the north part, there is a river and everything is drained to the river. Uh, we look at the uh, elevations of the roads and we try to find what is the surface flow in every road. And according to the flow direction in every road, we decided to, uh, we found the basins, sub-basins of stormwater networks. And using the SWIM program, which is called Stormwater Modeling uh, Management Modeling um, uh, Program, you can also implement uh, some rainwater harvesting. This LID control uh, led us to uh, try if we put, install uh, some rainwater harvesting tanks in, in, in each and every house, how much this will uh, affect the stormwater network uh, problems. So after the surface uh, flow directions or elevation directions in the in Güzelyurt, uh, in the city of Güzelyurt, we have seen that there are actually... Professor, sorry yes, for I'm interrupting. Okay, yes. okay, we are running out of time. Thank yeah, you, I'm, Professor. I'm almost done. Uh, we see that actually uh, there are four, uh, four regions for stormwater uh, subcatchments in Güzelyurt area. And by trial and error, we have seen that when it is raining around 20 millimeter per hour uh, and more than 20 millimeter per hour, some flooding starts to be uh, happening in the uh, city. And we also confirmed this with the municipality technical uh, authorities. Uh, then we tried uh, rainwater harvesting application into four re uh, two regions. And when we apply rainwater harvesting, in other words, when we are collecting uh, uh, rainwater from the rooftops, we have seen that this design rainfall, which uh, previously without rainwater harvesting, those A region and B region is experiencing flood after 20 millimeter per hour, local uh, urban flooding. But when we apply the rainwater harvesting, we see that this value moves up to around 35, 40 millimeter per hour. So more extreme, under more extreme conditions, we can have flood situations. Okay, as a final conclusion, uh, climate is changing, population is increasing, Therefore, the frequency of extreme rainfall events are also uh, increasing. Uh, the risk of more frequent urban flooding is uh, unfortunately increasing. So in order to solve this kind of problems, of course, this is not the only solution, but in addition to other solutions, uh, application, we have to adapt the cities into climate change and we should apply water-sensitive urban design techniques uh, as soon as possible. Thank you very much for your listening. Thank you very, thank you for your valuable presentation, Assistant Professor Dr. Bertu Akuntu. Uh, I guess we don't have any questions yet, so I would like to invite our next keynote speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Aslıhan Güzin Selçuk from Istanbul Gelişim University, Turkey. Thank you very much and hello to everyone. Uh, firstly, I want to start with introducing myself. Uh, I'm 
an assistant professor at the Department of Social Service uh, at Istanbul Gelişim University. And I'm also the director of Sustainable Environment and Community Center uh, and the coordinator of uh, community services. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the role of universities in achieving sustainable development goals and I'm going to present you a case from Turkey. Uh, this is the outline. Uh, I'm going to start with introduction uh, and talk about sustainable development goals uh, and present my case from Turkey. Let's start with introduction. Um, Earth is a closed system. Thus, our choices define our common future. So population size and the sources of environment must remain in balance on a global scale. Unfortunately, our consumption made a dystopia come true. Uh, I prefer the term dystopia. Destroyed habitats, endangered species, increased inequality, increased violence, uh, and a world on the way of extinction. So does transition towards sustainability become compulsory, especially in the last half of the 20th century? Then we have to define sustainable development. Under these cir circus circumstances, uh, sustainable development became the main topic of the world. Uh, it's paired with its social, economic, and environmental dimensions and had to be managed with an integrated perspective. This is the definition, as you see. Uh, it's defined by the United Nations in the Brundtland Report. Development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. These are the sustainable development goals, as we all know. Uh, they had emerged as a starting point, uh, which aimed to direct and combine the efforts towards a sustainable future. Sustainable development goals define a complex series of targets that address the global challenges, and it became a global implementation plan uh, for the governments, for public and private institutions, and also for the individuals. Uh, here you see the sustainable development goals, which address the global challenges. The first one is no poverty. It means ending poverty in its all forms. And the second one, zero hunger and ending hunger. Uh, achieving food security and also improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. Good health and well-being is another goal. Uh, it means ensuring healthy lives and promote uh, well-being uh, for all at all ages. And quality education, uh, and today I'm going to talk about the case from Turkey about quality education. Uh, it means ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and promoting lifelong learning opportunities for all. Gender equality, achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls. Uh, clean water and sanitation, ensuring uh, access to water and sanitation for all. Affordable and clean energy, uh, ensuring access to affordable, uh, reliable, sustainable, modern energy, decent work and economic growth, uh, promoting inclusive and uh, sustainable economic growth, and also employment. Industry innovation and infrastructure, it means uh, building a resilient uh, infrastructure and uh, promoting sustainable industrialization uh, and reduced inequalities, uh, reducing the inequality within and among the countries, 
sustainable cities and communities, uh, making cities inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Responsible consumption and production, ensuring uh, the sustainable consumption and production patterns. Climate action, uh, taking urgent action for the climate change and its impacts also. Life below water, uh, conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas and marine resources. Life on land, uh, sustainably managing forests, it means, and peace, justice and strong institutions uh, promoting peaceful and inclusive societies. And lastly, partnership for the goals. Uh, it means a global partnership for sustainable development. And these are the core values underlying the idea of sustainable development. Uh, freedom, the first. Men and women have the right to live their lives and uh, raise their children uh, free from hunger and from the fear of violence. Um, and the second one, equality. It means equal rights and opportunities of women and men uh, and solidarity. Global challenges must be managed in a way uh, in according with the basic principles of equi equity uh, and social justice uh, and tolerance, respecting each other uh, in all diversity of beliefs, culture and languages and respect for nature. Uh, only this way we can um, respect the nature and also um, the current unsustainable patterns of production and consumption uh, can change by respecting the nature. And lastly, shared responsibility, uh, responsibility for managing worldwide economic and social development, as well as threats to international peace and security must be shared among the nations of the world and uh, should be exercised multilaterally. Let's uh, talk about the case from Turkey. As I said before, governments are not the only bodies in charge with global problems. All stakeholders have to take responsibility and collaborate in achieving sustainable development. And moreover, the success of these collective efforts depends on the cooperation between stakeholders at all levels, local, national, regional, and global. And universities are responsible for building a sustainable future by shaping the generations and transforming the society into active stakeholders who have the power to change the world. Um, I'm going to um, present my analysis of the efforts and strategies of top five Turkish universities in times higher education impact rankings in terms of quality education. Uh, Times Higher Education Impact Rankings are the only global performance tables uh, that assess the university's efforts against the United Nations goals. Here you see the top five Turkish universities ranked in the Times Higher Education Impact Ranking 2021. Uh, the strategies of these universities, of top five Turkish universities, uh, can widen and deepen the scope of uh, higher education institutions at other developing countries. When um, analyzed, top universities' quality education strategies 
the common way of thinking can be seen clearly. There are two dimensions of these quality education strategies. Supporting early years of education and providing lifelong learning opportunities uh, open for all. Here you see the first strategy. Uh, it's understanding the conditions for effective learning environment. Um, the community that children grow up play a, plays a key role for acquiring desired behaviors for sustainable development, especially parents and early teachers influence children's development from the moment of birth, birth uh, from the beginning. So to support children's learning experience, uh, it's important to understand the conditions for effective learning, both home learning environment and school learning environment are important, uh, thus encouraging all stakeholders to maximize the children's potential is a fundamental strategy of these universities. And the second strategy, designing open resources for parents and teachers to support the learning experience both at school and at home. In terms of the second strategy, all top Turkish universities design resources to provide learning for parents and teachers. And greater support and resources are needed for relevant initial and continuous professional development. Digital learning systems, massive open online courses, self-directed learning content, um, mobile reading platforms, uh, tools for teachers to create learning content, and etc. Et By creating open resources for parents and also for teachers to support the learning experience, both at school and at home, can improve the interaction quality with the children for a sustainable future. And the third strategy, is removing borders to access education to give all members of the society a fair chance to learn and develop their skills and to participate in social, economic and political life. Um, inclusion and acuity in education and training are vital to ensure a transformative education and the right to quality education and learning throughout life based on principles of non-discrimination, gender equality, and equal opportunity for all must be ensured. The main idea underlying this educational opportunities provided by the top universities is inclusive education. Individuals from the need groups have to be supported by the responsible institutions, these are universities, to develop their skills, realize their potential, and become an active member of the society. There is a need to include migrants, and displaced persons, refugees, and stateless persons in the education and training system. And to facilitate recognition of their qualifications, skills, and competencies. This is the most important part of the quality education strategy of universities, to remove borders, to access education, to give all members of the society a fair chance to learn, to develop their skills, and to participate in life. Thus, top universities create special learning opportunities for excluded groups from all backgrounds in line with their strategy. And the other st strategy is integrated the needs analysis into strategic plans for quality education to define the barriers for participating in learning opportunities. The first step for participating learning environment is to clearly define the barriers 
and take action to remove them from the way. Thus, integrating uh, the needs analysis into the strategic plans for quality education is another common part that helped the universities to define the barriers for participating in learning opportunities. All the top five Turkish universities strategically designed research to identify solutions to the barriers. They tried to build an inclusive and supporting um, learning environment to help the community members uh, to develop social and also technical skills, enhance their abilities and encourage relationships gain confidence and build their capacity. And the other strategy is supporting the community members by providing free and paid trainings and providing access to university facilities. Education institutions, especially higher education institutions, must provide children, youth and adult learners with the competences to be active citizens in the society. This includes efforts to promote education for sustainable development and sustainable lifestyles, democracy and human rights, gender equality, physical education maybe, and sports, education in native language, peace uh, and global citizenship, active participation, cultural diversity, cultural dialogue, to create a, a transformation through sustainable development vision is, uh, it is a must to equip the members of the society with the knowledge and skills to develop innovative solutions to the global challenges and take responsibility for world problems. The common points of the strategies of top five Turkish universities is offering free courses, both on campus and online, and offering public lectures, events, workshops, uh, trainings, including managerial and vocational training, uh, and off-campus activities for members of the society. And also universities provide free access to educational resources such as uh, computer labs and libraries. Uh, and the last strategy uh, is designing spatial learning opportunities for excluded groups from all backgrounds. As globalization increased diversity, Universities have to develop strategies to create a productive and inclusive learning environment for the members of the community. Commonly, all the top Turkish universities develop strategies to design inclusive curriculum and to develop leadership for diversity to meet the diverse learning needs. To conclude, um, education is a public good and public responsibility, a fundamental human right, and an important basis for ensuring sustainable development. Thus, the quality education goal uh, is fundamental to build a sustainable community it needs to be included in the strategies of all the stakeholders, especially in universities. Uh, the mentioned strategies of the top five Turkish universities ranked in the time higher education impact rankings will um, shed light to other universities to recognize their sustainable future efforts through quality education by providing examples of implications. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Assistant Professor Dr. Aslıhan Güzin Selçuk for your valuable presentation. Now is the last speaker of day one, 
I would like to invite Associate Professor to deliver her speech. Associate Professor uh, As Nazihan Ursavash. Uh, can you please turn on your mic, please? Okay. Can you see uh, my screen? Yes, we can see your screen, and uh, I would appreciate if you can make it full screen. All right. That's perfectly fine, Professor. Okay, thank you. And uh, hello, I'm Nazihan Ursavash. Uh, I'm from Turkey and uh, working as an association professor doctor at Recep Tayyip Erdogan University. I'm a biology educator. Uh, before starting to my uh, speech, I want to uh, thank to conferences, committees, and special thanks to Professor Dr. Hüseyin Gökçekuş, who invited me to this ma meaningful conference. Uh, I want to send my lovely greetings to the people on this session and who are watching us uh, via on YouTube. Um, Especially, uh, I'm, I want to say that with pandemics, we are trying to uh, different experiences. We are experiencing experience new things. And this is my first uh, online English uh, presentation. And maybe I can take deep breathings. Sorry for this. And today, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, water literacy, the importance of water literacy. Uh, the importance of educational games in the improvement of water literacy. Um, this, is, this study is actually uh, a combination of my uh, former studies in the process. Uh, for more intense information, maybe you can read my uh, studies, former studies. Um, first, we can start with the background of the water literacy. Uh, it is not well known who defines water literacy first, but we can trace the evolution process of the concept in the history. Uh, Dr. T.J. Mills was one of the first researchers known uh, who focused on water and water quality education during his work with classroom teachers. Uh, Mills pointed to lack of knowledge and on current water issues, water resource management and the impact of water on shaping our past. In 1983, he carried out the Water Resources Education Project and he laid the foundations of the concept of water literacy by training students who have lack of knowledge about water resources. A decade later, Brody ascertained from the compiled studies on water and water related issues that there is a big gap and need in the curriculum. Brody set the framework of the water education curriculum for teachers. The principles of the curriculum later defined as the principles of the water literacy by Project VET. By the way, I want to uh, say that I am the uh, host institution coordinator of Turkey uh, from Project VET. Uh, uh, we were trained by Project VET in Montana and we are uh, serving and trained training uh, teachers and students about water literacy. Although the concept of water literacy entered our lives in the 90s, its definition hasn't been fully defined yet because of the inadequate amount of studies on water and water literacy until recently. The concept used to be initially handled with regard to environmental literacy and thus defined on this basis. In the 2010s, it's possible to see that more studies and definitions were made in the literature. It's thought that the emergence of environmental problems related to water resources in the last decade has increased the interest in the concept of water literacy. 
since then many definitions made like below uh, i won't read all of them but some of them water literacy is briefly known as education and awareness on effective use of water resources or a comp composition of the necessary water knowledge scientific water attitude and normative water behavior which is related to social economics living habits water ecological environment, water conservancy, propaganda, and education. In sum, water literacy can be defined as to have knowledge and awareness about the importance of water for life, the functioning of the water cycle, the recognition of resources in the immediate environment, and globally, its management and protection in a sustainable way, the use of scientific knowledge on water from different disciplines in solving problems with a system thinking and global perspective and take action for this purpose. Even there are lots of uh, content uh, to be a water literate, such as uh, water sheds, water quality, water pollution, uh, fresh waters, uh, water cycle is one of the main subjects individuals should know to be water literate. Like water cycle, many subjects related to water include abstract concepts. Individuals should be on abstract operation stage, which all these features began to be acquired at this age. Operational stage begins at approximately age 11 or 12 and lasts into adulthood. This stage covers the secondary school period. Students at secondary school should learn many concepts in different ways. Studies have shown that as the grade level increases, positive attitudes towards the science lesson turn negative, and the reason seems to be the use of deficient methods and techniques. To develop a positive attitude towards the science course, educational games are one of the methods in which students can actively participate, employ more than one sense organ, learn by doing and living, and ensure permanence of their knowledge while having fun. Educational games are not only games just allow students to have fun. They are the purposeful activities which have rules, a certain pedagogical content knowledge, measurement and assessment methods. With these characteristics, they are appropriate learning methods for the students who are at abstract operation stage. Children at this stage play games with rules, which represent the high level operational intelligence feature of children's cognitive development and reflect their thinking structures in abstract form. As the individual gains more experience and gets older, game activities with rules continue and develop throughout life. Piaget understood the importance of play in learning and the research shows how important and developmental play is to learning. The Freitas indicated that According to studies, educational games are seen overwhelmingly positive, effective learning tools. Recent studies has taken a turn away from merely attempting to show the possibility of using games in the classroom and toward the specific steps necessary to integrate them effectively into curricula. Although research on educational games continues to growing, there is still an unexplored area of study on the integration of games into the teaching process. Teachers have a very important role on the integration of the games into the teaching learning process. Although it is claimed that teaching with activities contribute, contributes to students in many ways, Preparing activities for learning outcomes is one of the known problems for teachers. Studies show that providing resources for teachers in developing countries has positive effects on student achievement. One of the major organizations providing educational game-based and action-oriented activities to teachers is Project VET, their main aim is to create a world that allows every child into every child to understand and evaluate water and have a sustainable future with an action-oriented approach. Project VET developed 64 activities. All activities were evaluated in terms of different variables, 
such as subject content, scientific disciplines, grade level, living skills, and literacy subdimensions. Seven of them were used uh, by Turkey Project Vet Host Institution in different teaching environments, such as Recep Tayyip Erdogan University supported projects, TÜBİTAK supported projects, in class teaching and school visits. In this study, there are uh, 17 different teaching uh, methods um, like simulations, reading, writing, gra uh, graphics and map uh, or discussion or experimental teaching methods. Uh, we use uh, two variables teaching methods and uh, six to eight grade levels. It's 26 of them were hands-on, 19 were whole body, 17 were game-based and six were role-playing activities. These are some of the activities uh, picture. Uh, we can see the names on, on the pictures. Uh, some of them are TÜBİTAK uh, supported projects and some of them are my uh, in-class activities with my students. And they, the others are, uh, for example, Hashiki Olympics, uh, Hash2 Olympics. Some of the parts, incredible journey, a drop in the bucket. They are teachers from different cities in Turkey. Uh, totally, we did this uh, uh, project two years, uh, for two years, and we have uh, nine, uh, sorry, uh, 49 uh, teachers from different uh, cities in Turkey and the Blue Planet activities with my uh, students. And some of them are again here. Uh, and uh, also we can see uh, small children, they, they were our school visits and again our uh, activities with our teachers and students. And of course, for more information and sharings, you can visit our social media accounts on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, when we look at the uh, distribution of the activities in terms of teaching methods, we can see all of them are hands-on activities. Uh, these are the only seven activities we are using in Turkey. Uh, three of them are whole body, three of them are with educational game, and two of them are role-playing activities. Even activities were stated appropriate with a range from preschool to K-12, uh, they can be used for undergraduate students, teachers, or citizens of all ages uh, we found. Distribution of the activities in terms of grade level, they are all appropriate for six to uh, eight grades. The water cycle is one of the prominent issues that water literate individuals should know. Although there are not many studies on the water cycle, uh, previous studies have revealed that students know inadequate and wrong concepts about water cycle. Based on this requirement, Incredible Journey educational game was used to enhance, enhance students' water cycle knowledge to improve water literacy. Students were evaluated by open-ended questions, word association tests, and drawings. Findings from open-ended questions revealed that students' insufficient understandings changed to sufficient understandings. The number of students in the insufficient category decreased by 80%, while this decrease is uh, 57 in the sixth grade, it is 75 in the seventh grade. For this reason, it is seen that the best change in student understanding is at the fifth grade level. Student responses to uh, water cycle were subject to content analysis in word association test. As a result of the analysis of the words associated with the water cycle at all grade levels, different themes emerged, revealing the students' comprehension in the pre- and post-test. These are the themes we have from uh, students. Uh, they may be decreased, but they uh, they are um, 
aware of saying uh, unrelated uh, unrelated words so protest teams decrease to for example at fifth grade 10 to 6 uh, at eight, uh, sixth grade 8 to 5 students draw water cycle and their drawings were analyzed with a rubric again according to test results average students were found insufficient and changed to sufficient uh, after uh, training fifth grade's average is 25 almost 26 in the pretest and uh, 61 in the post test sixth grade average is 28 in the pretest and 57 in the post test Seventh grade average is 25 in the pretest and 66 in the post test. According to the literature, it can be easily stated that educational games can enhance students' water literacy knowledge. Besides interest and attitudes towards lessons, it is recommended for teachers to use educational games in their teaching process to improve water literacy. Water cycle is very important content to improve water literate people. Water literacy training can be started from the fifth grade level. Since the improvement of water literacy closely related to the education, students will receive information training on educational games about water literacy can be given to teachers. Teachers can benefit from the activity titled Project Vet, The Incredible Journey or the others in their lessons. These are the selected references. And thank you for listening. That's all. Thank you very much for your valuable presentation, Associate Professor Nazihan Ursavash. I'm checking if we have any questions but I guess we don't have any questions from the participants. Therefore, I would like to announce the end of day one presentations. Today, we have hosted wonderful and very valuable scientists from all over the world. I would like to thank all of our presenters and all the dear ones who have shown the courtesy to attend and honored us with their presence. Tomorrow, the conference will continue for four consecutive sessions. Thank you for being with us and hope to meeting you tomorrow. I wish you good and healthy days. Thank you very much, professors. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Nice meeting you. Nice to yes, meet you. Nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you, and thank you. Have a good night. Dreaming.